talk is by Jose, I hope I pronounced that correctly, and it's about making Haskell more appealing to Python programmers. <laughs> 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 Um, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, it's true. I mean, uh, we, we had Haskell with this rather intricate type system. Um, and then why go all the way and just say, oh, ignore this errors and just run my program, I don't care. Because this is a complaint you often get from people who are used to dynamically typed languages. That the types get in the way, and you just want to run your program and see if it works. So, with this work we just have a... Um, in a, in a simple way, we've been able to allow you to run programs that have type errors, and they only you only get these errors at runtime if you actually execute something, some part of your program that has the type error. And we can do this without losing type soundness and without paying any performance penalty for it because we're not doing any runtime checks. So uh, this is joint work with Demetrius and Simon. Uh, I'm now at the University of Oxford, at, of Oxford, but this is work that I've done when I was at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. So GC 7.6 is out, so now you can download it and invoke the uh, interpreter with this flag minus f defer type errors, and then you can define a value, which is a pair. On the left you put a true, and on the right you put something that is obviously uh, wrong, a conjunction between a character and a boolean. The compiler will tell you, oh, look, there's a type error here, but instead of making it into, a, into an error, it makes it into a warning. So, you know you're doing something wrong, but you can go on. And you can, for instance, ask for the first component of this pair. And that's fine, because there's nothing wrong with the first component, so you can just get it, that's fine. However, if you ask for the second component of the pair, then you get exactly the error that you previously got as a warning, with the exact same location, and the added information that, uh, oh, this is something that you've seen before, so you run, you took the risk and now you run into the, the error. Why would we want to do this? Um, I often find myself just experimenting something in a, in a text file and running it, and then I decide to change something, and then it starts coming out of, commenting out a function, but then, because this function is called from other places, I have to comment out other code, and etc, etc. So I end up spending more time commenting than actually programming. Um, with deferred type errors, you can have like a, a lazily uh, commenting out of your code, because if you only run the part of your program that you know will work, then you will not have problems with the type errors in the rest of the program. Imagine you have a large project, and um, you uh, need to change something in the basic infrastructure, and you know this is going to take you a week to change the entire program. But after the first day, say, that you already refactor the parts, you want to be able to run your test suite and see if uh, the changes you've done already work. But if the test suite depends on the entire program compiling, then you're not going to be able to do it because the rest still has type errors. If you can defer it, then you can run it and see if what you've done already works. If you have an integrated development environment, you often want to provide feedback regarding the type of expressions even as the user is still writing the program. So it has a potentially uh, incomplete and potentially uh, type incorrect program. And we call this paper a Perl because we thought it was um, pretty easy to do this in GHC because of a combination of factors that, uh, that are present in GHC and are not all that common. We have and rely essentially on the fact that there are coercions in, uh, in GHC, in the core language of GHC. Um, laziness is also important because this means that the errors are only evaluated if you actually get into them. We also rely on kind polymorphism, well, it simplifies the, the theory. And um, the fact that we have an optimizing compiler, which in particular also optimizes coercions, means that we will pay little to no overhead for, from having these coercions around. Um, so to see how this works, I'll let us show you a bit of how GHC actually compiles code. Back to our example of this pair, um, GHC compiles this into a um, into a let with uh, some evidence for the fact that character is equal to boolean. So the tilde here is a type equality constraint. Um, but of course, there's no evidence for that equality because it's bogus. So it just fills in an error 
with the actual type error message that you have logged. Um, and then it uh, puts a cast around this, uh, this character uh, with the coercion that has been generated. Because of laziness, we'll only get an error if this second component is evaluated. Um, how does type inference with this constraint work? So let's take a step back and look at this expression um, show of x's, where x is a list of integers, and show is the function that has the class constraint for all a show a goes from a to string. So the first thing that GHC does is to generate constraints and an elaborated term. Because the core language is a, uh, is a, is a variant of system map, type application is explicit, so show will then take uh, two more arguments. The first one is this type, list of int, that corresponds to the abstraction for all a. And the second argument uh, is a constraint that corresponds to the uh, class show a constraint up there. Because of course at runtime this, this show a constraint just becomes a, a dictionary that tells you how you can actually convert this a's to strings. And then we have this constraint um, that, that tells you how you can show the list of integers. Um, and this is wrong, it should be uh, int, show int, because the constraint is on the, uh, the axis are lists of strings, so this should be, uh, the axis list of int, so this should be an int, sorry. Um, then the next step is to actually solve the constraints that have been generated. And in this case that's pretty easy, because it's uh, just looking up the instances that we have available, and then we find an instance for show int, and we can just fill out the definition of d6, which we then use in, uh, in show. Now, this is not the whole story actually, because uh, GHC is a bit more general than that. So, the first thing it does when elaborating this term is to put in some fresh unification variable, alpha. And then later it's going to realize that this is applied to axis, so this alpha should be of type list of int. So, you get another constraint that says that alpha is equal to list of int. And we have still the uh, show alpha constraint. And then the next step is to solve all the constraints that have been collected in the program. Um, so given these constraints for this term, how can we solve them? If we know that alpha is a list of int, then um, in this constraint C5 we'll just have to prove that list of int is list of int. Now we can build by a trivial uh, quality uh, reflexivity on list of int. And then uh, the, uh, the class constraint is uh, built as before. Now, you might be worrying about having these constraints around and these being built in labs and then constructed again. The good thing is that they're optimized away, and in pretty much the same way that um, integer arithmetic, for instance, has been already optimized for the past 20 years or so. Um, internally, integers in GHC, so what the programmer sees is a lifted integer type, or box, and, but internally they are actually just a constructor with an actual machine integer, 32 bit or so. And then the uh, addition on integers that the programmer sees, what it's actually doing is pattern matching on these machine integers and actually performing the machine addition. So, if you have something like x plus x, what you first get is, um, is an expression that does case analysis on x twice by the definition of plus int. But then the inliner and optimizer kick in and see that there's a case analysis of x twice and this can be replaced by a single case analysis. A similar story happens for type equalities because the type equality that the program sees, this tilde, is a lifted equality which is internally represented by an unlifted equality between the two types, alpha and beta. The difference with the integers is that this, this, this static equality will not actually take up any space in memory, it's a zero-bit thing which will eventually get erased away. And uh, the cast that we've also seen is also just a wrapper for the internal, um, for the actual internal coercion, which is just pattern matching on a constructor, RBQ. So, if we have, for instance, a trivial equality constraint that arises often, you definitely want 
all of this to be optimized away. So in this case we have a constraint that says that characters equals characters, um, and we're casting some expression for this constraint. So what the compiler will do is to uh, inline the definition of make raffle, so we get C to be an, a direct call to the constructor of the equality with the types and the actual internal proof of equality. And we replace the cast also by its definition, which then becomes a case analysis of C. And then the next step is to replace C here, and then we have a case of constants that can be optimized away, so we both the let and the case disappear, and we just get a call to the internal uh, static cast. On the other hand, if we have deferred type errors, these get uh, optimized to direct calls to the error function. So, if we have some equality that cannot be satisfied, uh, the evidence generated for it is just a runtime error. Um, and then, if we inline the if we inline the definition of cost here, we're just going to get a case expression over an error. And that's another standard optimization in GHC. If you're doing case analysis over an error, you can just get rid of the body of the case because you're not going to get there. So the case error is just replaced by an error directly. So we get optimization and even for free because all this machinery was already in GHC. So, to conclude, we think this is a valuable feature to have that can be, uh, can be put to good use. And uh, it's also a, an interesting story, a constructive story about how you can make use of all these features in GHC. One thing I haven't really shown is how we make use of kind polymorphism. So it turns out we don't need just uh, equalities between things like uh, uh, integers and characters, but we also need them at higher kinds, like maybes, either, lists, etc. Um, we could, of course, have different equalities for different kinds, or we could build the equality into the meta theory. But since we have kind polymorphism, the, this equality type is just kind polymorphic, so it will work for types of all kinds. It's also important to note what this doesn't do. So, it's just about type errors. If your program has any sort of parsed errors, um, or kind errors, um, if, you're, if you have an IDE, you might, you might think that you also want to handle this in some way to still provide some good feedback. But of course, this is external to, uh, to what we've been doing. For parse errors, you might want to use an error-correcting parser, like the uh, UHC compiler does. And for kind errors, we can't do them in the same way, because as it stands now, we don't have uh, kind equalities. We just have type equalities. Also, this is not full dynamic typing. It gives you some of the advantages of dynamic typing, like you can run your program even without it having all type correct. But if you define a function saying it's polymorphic on A, and then you assume that A is an integer, you have a type error there, which you can defer. And if at runtime you call this function with an integer, you'll still get an error, because, well, there's still a coercion there saying A is int and you can't fault it. So it's not dynamic typing. But it gives you some of the advantages of, of dynamic typing, and it's uh, cheap and easy to implement. So, that's it. Thank you.